have a very, very important topic. And we've called this topic Becoming a Great Commission Church. Very famous story told of Vince Lombardi of the Green Bay Packers, one of the greatest coaches of all times. And every year when he would start the year of practice, he would hold up a football before the players and say, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would go over all the fundamentals. Every year they would go over the fundamentals before they would start practice. We are going to look at the fundamentals, the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ, his final marching orders uh, to his people. And so it is essential for elders to know this because we get off track so easily. In fact, sociologists say this is the age of distractions. We have more distractions than people have ever had in, in a lifetime. And do not assume that your missionaries or you or your local church really grasp the full Great Commission. That's going to be our goal now in our next message, to make sure we understand the full Great Commission, because many people believe in the Great Commission, but they have a partial Great Commission. They put that ellipsis in, those three dots, and they eliminate a major part of the Great Commission. So let's begin by turning to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. And wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to stand right now in respect to the Word of God, and we are going to uh, read this passage. If some of you are blocking that camera, you may not be able to stand right now. Okay, we're okay. These are our, war, our Lord's own words before he leaves this earth. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may be seated. We want to look at the greatness of the Great Commission. So here's what I want to do. We're going to look at the greatness of the Great Commission in some detail, and then the rest of our time is going to be very practical ideas of how to improve our Great Commission church. I think you all agree with the Great Commission, but so often we don't know how to implement it or how to improve it. So we want to spend at least half our time with very, very practical ideas of how to help our local churches. First, the greatness of the author. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. So we have the 11 disciples, possibly the 500 mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 16, who come to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Their automatic response is to worship him. Now, I want to remind you, these are Jews. These are not Gentiles. Gentiles, they'll, they'll worship anything, you know, cows, rats, moon, wood, rock, but not Jews. They know through their long history that you can only worship God, the one true living God. That is something they believe. So here you have the Gospel of Matthew, and it ends with the disciples not just listening to his marvelous teaching, but worshiping him. That is strategically placed at the end of this Jewish gospel that presents Christ as king and as Messiah. It ends with him being worshipped. We too worship him. He's no ordinary teacher. He's no ordinary leader. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We actually give our life to him. 
We give him our everything. He is our Savior, our God, our Lord. So in a real sense, who he is sets the tone for the rest of the commission. He gives the commission, and the commission is all about him. In fact, all through the Gospel of Matthew, it's all about him. And we'll see that uh, first-person pronoun in just a moment. Now, they worship him. But notice what it says here, but some doubt it. Very realistic, isn't it? Only the Spirit would tell us the truth. Some doubt it. Now, isn't it hard to believe? How could you doubt they saw these marvelous miracles? They hear teaching unlike anyone has ever taught, and yet they doubt. And here he is right in front of them, right in front of their eyes, and they can hear his words. Do you know this is the fundamental problem of fallen humanity? It's unbelief. We simply will not believe. Even when evidence is put right in front of us, we doubt. Some doubt it. Second, the greatness of his claim. First, the greatness of the author. He is worship, which means he has to be God. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, we're so used to this, we do not realize the profundity of this. But this is either true or it's sheer madness for someone to say, all authority in the heavens and on earth has been given to me. Now, can you imagine if I go to my wife and I say to her, Marilyn, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Well, you have to know my wife. She'd say, okay, power man, go take out the trash. <laughs> imagine if I go to my fellow elders at an elders meeting, I say, gentlemen, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Well, they're very kind men. They are. First, they'd get a doctor, maybe give me some good medication, call my wife and say, would you come get your husband? He's delusional. He thinks that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Well, I would be delusional, and I would need help. However, they didn't laugh when our Lord said this. You know why? Because it's true. The end of Luke's uh, gospel, he says to the disciples, all the Old Testament's about me. Moses wrote about me. The Psalms, they're about me. All the offerings, festivals, they're all about me. Now, that, that would be madness if it wasn't true, wouldn't it? it he even says, Speaking of the Old Testament, the things concerning himself. In other words, the Old Testament's all about him. You can't say that. I can't say that. It would be, uh, would be a funny. It would be a joke if we were to say that. Or it would be sick, either one. But Christ says these things, and sometimes they just go over our head because we're so used to it. But capture it. This is either true or it is madness of mind. Now, in the Greek text, it says, given to me is placed in the first emphatic position. It says literally, given to me is all authority, both in heaven and on earth. Notice the first person pronoun is key here. In fact, it's key to the whole Gospel of Matthew. You remember the Sermon on the Mountain? Jesus would say, well, the rabbis say this, the professionals say this, the writers say this, but I say to you, I say to you, I say to you. That's because he's God in flesh. And that's how the whole book of Matthew starts. God with us, Emmanuel. Given to me is all authority. The whole commission is given by Christ, and it's about Christ. The whole book of Matthew is about Christ, the perfect Son of God. Now, given to me, who is it given by? Well, it's given by God the Father as a gift to him. As a result of his death, burial, and resurrection, this authority was given by God to him over heaven and over all earth. This is Jesus' also final self-claim. It's a new revelation about himself. Jesus is sovereign Lord over heaven and over earth. On this earth, he has authority 
over seven and a half billion people. He has authority over the Kremlin. He has authority over Beijing, China. Over the White House. He towers over all the world leaders. Revelation 1.5 says this. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And we're told in Philippians 2, the day will come when they will all bow to him. Even if they hate him now, and they reject him now, someday they are going to drop to their knees in complete humility and self-acknowledgement of who he is. Revelation 5.13 says this, And I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. In heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ is central to the worship of all the angels. So he has authority over this whole earth. And he has authority over all the angels of heaven and over all the demonic hosts. All authority has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of his great salvation work for us. Now, this statement shows us the greatness and the power and the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one else like him. He's the incomparable Christ, awesome in power and authority. He cannot be placed in the pantheon of gods. When you hear people say, well, Jesus is just another teacher. There are many, many ways to God. Well, if you really understand Jesus Christ and what he's saying and what the Bible's saying, that's impossible. It's impossible. There is no one like him. He's not the mild-mannered humanist that the liberals say he is. Now, there's something else very important here about all authority. Since he has all authority over this earth and over heaven, the religion of Christianity is not a local religion. Now you hear this. I've been in Asia a number of times, and you hear this very often. It said, well, Christianity is a Western religion. Have you ever heard that? It's a local religion. It's a Western religion. My friends, Jesus was not born in America. He wasn't even born in Europe. He's born in Palestine. He's Mideastern. Probably had a nice tan skin, unlike my little white skin. Christianity is for the world. It's a universal salvation. And he is saying here, what I have done for you must be told to the world. So this is not a local religion. It's a religion, it's the truth, and it must be proclaimed to everyone. Now third... The greatness of the commission. So first we see the greatness of the author. The greatness of his claim. Universal authority. And now we see the greatness of the commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. Now in light of all authority being given to him, he can say this. Disciple all nations. He can only say that because of who he is and the authority given to him by God the Father. Now, the problems of going to all nations is insurmountable. They didn't have cars. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have radios, television, any of the modern devices of communication. They had feet, they had to walk, they had to talk. How in the world are they gonna disciple all nations? All authority has been given to me, and I've got your back. I'm behind you. I'm sending you. I will be with you. That's how this will actually end. So who Christ is, the incomparable Christ, awesome in power and authority, he gives this commission, and he'll help them. They will not be alone in what they are to do. Now the core of the Great Commission, the core. The core of it is the verb disciple. It's the main verb. We have make disciples, or you can just say disciple. 
Notice it's an imperative verb. In other words, it's a command. It's an imperative. It's not the great suggestion. It's the great command. Now, the verb disciple is related, of course, to the noun disciple, which we're very, very familiar with. Disciple is a designation that Matthew uses to describe a believer. However, it emphasizes a certain thing about the believer. It emphasizes believing, following, learning, obeying, submitting to, becoming like the master. So the word has quite a, a breadth of uh, meaning to it. Now, the process of making disciples begins with proclaiming the gospel to those who have not heard it or have received it yet. So if you look at Acts 14.22, it says this. When they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples. There we see clearly a disciple is a believer. How do they become believers? Well, it starts with evangelism. The whole process starts with evangelism with proclamation, because it's news. It's good news, right? That's what the word means, good news. Gospel is good news. Well, if you have good news, you've got to talk. You've got to express it. You can't just live it. You have to tell it. Living is sort of the verifying data of the message, but you must speak. You must proclaim. You must announce. You must witness. Hear ye, hear ye. So, the whole process begins with direct evangelism, proselyting, telling the story. Now, what is rather new and shocking is the scope of what our Lord says. It is to all nations. Now, if he said evangelize, tell of my work, tell of my person, they would not have been surprised by that because they had already been doing that. In fact, very early in Matthew's Gospel, the fourth chapter, he says, uh, if you follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men, if you follow me. So they knew that. They were out to catch men. They were out to tell people that the Messiah was here. So that was uh, obvious to them. But now our Lord says something that would have been very, very shocking to them. I want you to disciple not just Jews, I want you to disciple all nations, all countries. The Great Commission is fundamentally world evangelism. It's a global enterprise for the United States, for Mexico, for all of South America. It's for Africa, China, and Russia. And it's for Europe, and it's for India, and Korea, and Japan. Acts 1.8 says, to the end of the earth. Our Lord's final marching orders are global evangelism. We're internationalists. We're globalists. We have a great vision, a great commission placed before us. It's not a little gospel. It's not a small commission, it's a great commission. On the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.5, we're told that there were people from every nation under heaven. Right when the church began, when the gospel was proclaimed to the nation, right there in Jerusalem, God had already brought people from every nation. And you notice on that day of Pentecost that the disciples spoke in tongues. Tongues meant languages. It's very obvious from the context because he names all the countries. And the sign of tongues was, you are to have this message in every language, in every tongue. And that's why we have whole organizations today given to put the Bible, the words of our Lord, the message, the good news, salvation offered freely to all who will believe, in every language, in every language. We're told today that we really should not evangelize. It hurts people, divides nations, 
I don't know if you remember this several years ago in Afghanistan, there were a group of young people doing mercy ministries and one had been killed and others had been captured by the radicals. And you would think the response in Europe and other places would be sympathy for these young people. There was no sympathy. In the papers in Europe was, what are they doing there? Are they going to convert people? They shouldn't be doing that. Leave people alone. All it does is divide people and, and cause uh, uh, national problems. Many countries of the world, it's against the law to evangelize or try to change a person's religion. So we're told today by our modern secularists, you shouldn't be doing that. Leave people alone. Everyone's got their own religion. Give them a break. Well, my friends, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. It's the direct orders of our Lord, all nations, to tell them what Christ has done. What he has done is so great, it must be told to the whole world. Be terrible that Christ went to the cross bearing the sins, a sin-bearing sacrifice, who can forgive all your sins, give you eternal life, give you the Spirit of God. And not to tell people would be terrible. Part of the gospel must be the very act of telling good news. Now, there's some real hypocrisy here. We are told we should not be trying to convert people. We, we should not be trying to change people's religion, right? And yet, what are the secularists doing every single day on television, on radio, on advertising, on the Internet? What are they doing every single day, 24 hours a day? And they've got great teachers, by the way. They are evangelizing. They are secularizing us. It's happening very quickly. So the hypocrisy is we're not to say anything, but they have a religion. It's a secularized humanistic religion. They have a very, very clear philosophy. It eliminates any thought of God. And of course, Christ was just a good teacher. You don't need salvation. You need a better job. That's what you need. They're telling us this, and they don't stop, and they're very convinced they are right and we are wrong. And they are very good at it. You look at all the social changes, moral changes, in the last 15 years. How did this happen? TV, sitcoms, movies, novels. They've been selling us constantly. And that's why we must push back, and we must say we're under divine orders to tell people of Christ. And we want people to be converted to the true and living God. And we don't need to apologize, by the way. Now let's go back to our main verb. The main verb is disciple. This main verb, the grammar is very interesting, is surrounded by three participles. There's the first participle, going, and then the next two, baptizing and teaching. So what I want to show you is that we have an explanation of what this discipling looks like, all right? So the first thing he says, and it's a participle, but it could be uh, used like a, an imperative, go or going. I like what uh, Frederick Dale Bruner, he puts it this way, move out, get moving, reach out. Well, it's implied in the command. The command is disciple all nations. Well, they're all in Jerusalem at this time or in Galilee, a little a small locality in the world, well, there's no way they can reach all nations unless they move out, get going, reach out to others. Now, they've been trained for three years, so they are trained in winning people, but it's going to be much bigger than they thought. They're going to have to move out to places of the world that really they don't want to go. Now, there's something very important here that we need to grasp, and that is this. We have a very big problem today, and it's a big problem. Very few young people are moving out, reaching out, going out, leaving. Missionaries are coming off the field in droves. They're retiring, health problems, parent problems. And so we have many, many missionaries coming back from the field, and the field is getting more difficult. I'll talk about that in a little while. We need new recruits. We need people to start moving out. And you know, it's pretty comfortable here in America. Pretty comfortable. Who'd want to move out? We've got a good, nice restaurants all around, good vacation spots. 
can get good jobs if you're talented at all, make some good money, have a nice home, fancy car. Who'd want to give up all that? But someone's got to move out. Someone's got to take the gospel to other parts of the world. Now, our Lord knew this was a problem. So in Luke 10, 2, we read, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, plenty of places to go. Here's the problem, and it's always the problem. The laborers are few. Do you know that problem? The laborers are few. Try to find a Sunday school teacher, a youth worker, no less a missionary. Well, what do we do? Therefore, pray earnestly, get serious about it, to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so we'll look at this in the practical section, but right here we can say this. It's a divine prayer given by our Lord himself. We are to pray for laborers. We're to pray for people to move out, get going, reach out, leave. Now, after this uh, first participle, uh, we have two more participles, baptizing and teaching, which are going to help define what this disciple-making is like. D.A. Carson writes, This task of making disciples is characterized by baptism and instruction. I'm going to spend some time on this because the first part, we all agree. No, no one has a problem with this, disciple all nations. You see it on a lot of literature. But here is where we fall down in the Great Commission. And uh, the full Great Commission is what we want to make sure we understand and our missionaries understand. I've asked many missionaries this question. Could you describe to me the full Great Commission, the full orbited command of our Lord? Very few have understood uh, maybe we don't really understand the full Great Commission, what our Lord is asking of us. I don't think any missionary should go to the field until that missionary can uh, clarify and articulate the full Great Commission. Even if he's not involved in direct evangelism, how would his ministry aid the full Great Commission? So the first uh, participle that follows our main verb is this baptizing the new disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I wasn't being baptized, by the way. <laughs> note carefully, note carefully, the rite of baptism is a part of the Great Commission. Did you ever think of that? The rite of baptism is a part of the Great Commission. Making disciples includes baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the disciple publicly proclaims his or her identification with Christ as a follower, a learner, a pupil, or a student. Now, I want to say that baptism is full of deep theological meaning. Deep theological meaning. We're going to see that in just a moment. It's very significant. In baptism, we see and proclaim the greatness of the gospel message, the death of the Son of God, His burial, His physical, bodily resurrection from the dead. Our union with Christ, wonderful teaching in the Gospels, in the Epistles. Union with Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit. New life in Christ. Forgiveness of sins. Cleansing of sins. A new beginning and a new commitment. This is what a follower does. A follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is baptized and in the baptism, all this is signified. The whole gospel is displayed. Isn't it interesting? Both in the baptism and the Lord's Supper, it emphasizes the gospel. It emphasizes the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and even the coming of the Lord Jesus. We need to teach disciples all that is involved in baptism. They should not be baptized until they understand the significance of it. They're not just getting wet. 
Baptism is not an option. Over 20 times it's mentioned in the book of Acts. When a person was saved, they were baptized. Now I want you to notice another significant feature in this baptism, and that is the formula used here in Matthew's Gospel. Very, very profound. When you're baptized, Jesus says you're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice you're not baptized in the name of John the Baptist. You're not named baptized in the name of John Calvin. You're not named uh, baptized in the name of John Wesley. You're not baptized in the name of any denomination. Reminds me of a lady in our church that moved to the far side of Denver and started going to church there. And uh, the pastor said to this lady from our church, well, uh, have you been baptized? Well, of course, she didn't baptize in our church. She said, oh, no, you have to be baptized in our church. So she calls me and said, what should I do? They want me to be baptized in their church. I said, all right, well, ask the pastor this. Ask him, did you die for my sins? If he died for your sins, get baptized in his name. Are you going to be baptized in his name or the name of his denomination? There's only one baptism. Ephesians 4 tells us that. One baptism, and that should suit any evangelical Bible-believing church because there's only one church. There's only one body of Christ. We're the ones that broke it up into all these denominations. Now, the name here is very significant. And it's sort of unexpected here at the end of uh, this Jewish gospel. We're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not the names. Now, normally we would say uh, correct grammar. In the names, there's three names here, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's only one. In the name, all three are placed on the same level. What we have here is one of the first indications of the formula of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there's something else here. The divinity of Christ comes out here. We confess this one God with three names as true God. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. Bruner writes this. The Son's name inside the one name was used by the early Christians to defend the de de deity of Christ and in the great Christological controversies, Athanasius argued this point against Arius. The Son is put on the same level as the Father and the Spirit in this terse, triadic formula. In other words, in our salvation, all three members of the Trinity are involved. All three members are involved in our salvation. The Father sends the Son. The Son performs the sacrificial work. Spirit applies the work to us. It's a great salvation that we have. A great salvation. And in our baptism, we confess this. Triune God. Now, some people say this, and, and I don't want to make a big deal about it. Uh, they say... This is not a command to baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because we don't see that in the book of Acts. Well, I would just respond by saying this. Why wouldn't you want to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Jesus said it. So whether you think it's an absolute formula I have to use or not use, I don't want to push it to the nth degree to say it's heresy or anything, but why would you not want to use it? And the Lord gave it. I just think it's better to follow what he said. Baptize in that name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because so much is taught in it. You miss that. You miss that if you don't get that. This is why baptism is such an excellent time for evangelism. Because the gospel is proclaimed. So, in baptism we see more about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting? He gave the Great Commission, and when we look at the Great Commission, it's all about him. And more self-revelations about him. That's why it's strategically placed at the very end of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel begins with Christ's birth and his lineage 
And then the prophetic fulfillment of Isaiah, a virgin will conceive, Emmanuel with us, and it ends with him being worshipped. And then more revelations that he is placed within the triune nature of God. Now, this is actually a good stopping point right now. What I want to come back to in a moment is baptism has fallen on very hard times. And I want to talk about that because I am meeting people like just weeks ago, spoke at a church, people in their 70s came up, well, we've never been baptized. People are not emphasizing this today. They're not even explaining it. So I want to come back to that and show you why it's part of the Great Commission. So this is a good stopping point. We'll come back to this.